Morning, everyone, and for those watching online, I, I fear I have to start with an apology for us being late already, which I can only put down to the fact that the pastries here are quite good, and I think people got quite wrapped up in them. So I apologise that we're starting five minutes late. Welcome to the UK in a Changing Europe uh, annual conference, which apparently this year I'm kicking off. If you want evidence of the fact that we were utterly desperate to fill the slots left by the politicians who pulled out of giving keynotes, the fact that I'm standing here now is your evidence. This is how desperate we became. Uh, let me introduce to you Professor Katie Hayward, who's going to chair this session. She'll be known to most, if not all of you, and she's speaking on the first uh, panel. But what I'm going to do very, very quickly is run through some of the highlights from the report that we brought out today. Look at that. Seamless. Uh, I'm slightly reluctant to do this. I'm slightly reluctant to do this partly because I've been asked to sort of talk about prospects and talk about the future. And I have a spectacularly bad track record when it comes to talking about the future. We did our first ever annual conference almost, I think, eight years ago to the day, just around the corner at the QE2, just before the referendum. And in my introduction to that conference, I remember I said, uh, I'd had a rare, vanishingly rare, unique, in fact, conversation with my son who pretended to be interested in my work for the only time in his life and said to me, what will happen if we vote to leave the European Union? And I said to him, well, I'll become a multimillionaire on consultancy fees and you'll never get a job. Uh, and I was spectacularly wrong, sadly, in one case, on both counts. But I'm going to try at the end of this talk to uh, say a little bit about where we might be going in the future. But I'm going to start off talking about what we know now about Brexit. Because, of course, one of the things about Brexit was a number of claims were made about it before it actually happened. Uh, and a lot of those claims, of course, were economic. And I think a lot of people thought at the time of the referendum and those sort of years after following the referendum before the signing of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement that the economic debate was a little bit silly. And it was a little bit silly on both sides, partly because this notion of a clef cliff edge was never going to materialise. That actually claiming that leaving Brexit would mean to lead to an immediate seismic shock to the economy was always going to be misleading. And that, and that, in a way, is how it turned out. Brexit was always going to be more of a slow puncture than it was a cliff edge. And if you think about a slow puncture, for those of you who actually do cycle, there's two defining features about them. One, it takes you absolutely ages to find out that you've got one. I mean, you can keep cycling, keep cycling, you get gradually slower over time. You blame your legs, or you blame your age, in my case until finally you realize several weeks later that you've got a slow puncture. But the second thing about slow punctures is once you've realized you've got one, it's almost impossible to figure out where you picked it up because it's so long after the event. And I think the Brexit economic effect is a bit like this in the sense that it's more subtle. And one of the important things about that is that in the political debate, my suspicion is over time, pinning economic outcomes to a referendum that happened in the distant past is going to become quite difficult. And I think that is going to be an issue that particularly campaigners for a closer relationship with the European Union are going to have to address. What we do know now from the data, and we go over this in the report, is that the outcomes were slightly more subtle and more complicated than the forecast would have had us believe initially. This is the famous doppelganger by John Springford. It's a perfectly respectable way of trying to estimate the costs of Brexit. I think the feelings amongst our team are that the ultimate numbers he comes up with are not massively credible because they're just a bit bigger than it feels. So the, the basis of his argument is, had we stayed in, our growth would have been significantly faster than both the French and the Germans, and there's no necessary reason to think this. So I think. We remain uncertain as to the precise economic impact of Brexit, and I think we will for the foreseeable future, partly because these things are intrinsically hard to calculate, partly because there's so much noise around this. If you think about what's been going on at the same time with COVID, the war in Ukraine, it's very, very hard to isolate the Brexit impact. But what we are getting a slightly clearer view about is the fact that there has been an impact on goods trade. And here, what I said earlier about reality being more complex than forecasts, I think, is very important because two things here. One, our goods trade has, it would appear, been hit 
as a result of Brexit. And actually, not only our goods trade with the European Union, but there is evidence to suggest that our global goods trade has been hit as a result of Brexit. And one possible explanation, and it's only a, an assumption or a hypothesis at the moment, is because we deal with complex supply chains when we're making things, that even if the ultimate destination for an export is China or India, because we're using parts that are made in the European Union, there is a Brexit effect on that trade too. I should say the flip side, which is another curiosity of the data, is that our services trade has held up pretty well. And again here, we're not exactly sure why. I suppose intuitively you'd think our services trade would have been hit worse than our goods trade given the nature of the trade and cooperation agreement. One explanation that I really like is that services exports have held up fairly well because of COVID, by which I mean we learnt during COVID to do stuff virtually that we used to do in person. And one of the things that's happened as a result of COVID is we've started exporting services virtually, which we would have done in person beforehand. And I mean, any academic can tell you that if you're offered to give a guest lecture for a fee, it's probably a lot easier to do it online than to fill in the paperwork necessary to get the visa required to go to the country nowadays. So the data is messy, the data is confusing, the data is complex, but I think what we can say is there has clearly been an impact on our trade of Brexit, and that is an impact that will feed into the domestic economy and keep feeding into the domestic economy over time. So we've had, an ec we've had a set of economic data that allow us to draw some conclusions. We've also had a lot of data about public opinion uh, and the most striking thing is the way that public opinion has shifted, not just since the referendum of 2016, but since we left the European Union as well. Uh, this shift has been profound. It's been a fairly steady trend. You can see polling too, where people say that they would vote to rejoin. Uh, so public opinion is shifting and there's an economic effect. Let me just say by way of sort of qualification that for those of you who are thinking public opinion is shifting and so therefore there is a real appetite to rejoin, that what there is an appetite for is not to talk about this ever again, ever. Uh, it is one thing to say that a majority of the British people think that the decision we took in 2016 was a wrong decision. It's another entirely to jump from that to the conclusion that they're dying to do it all over again, because quite frankly, at the moment, they're not. The, the declining salience of Brexit is one of the striking things about how public opinion has moved since those heady days where wherever you went in the country, people were talking about Brexit all the time without stopping. Now that, in a way, that salience uh, chart illustrates why we get this, which is in our politics, in our political debate, in the election debate, we hear very little at all about Brexit. I mean, honorable exceptions, the SNP and Stephen Flynn, who tries to raise it at every possible opportunity, but with the major parties, Brexit is not an issue. Now, there are many reasons for this. I think public opinion is one of them. I think the supposed vulnerabilities of either party when it comes to Brexit is another. The Conservatives don't want to talk about something that they mastermind that the majority of people think has been a failure. Labour, I think, trying to woo leave voters, and also a sense that Keir Starmer might be slightly vulnerable on the issue of Brexit. So there's a kind of vow of silence about the issue. It's a vow of silence not entirely observed in the manifestos. Uh, the Tory manifesto is, to put it politely, a bit thin on Brexit, outlining supposed opportunities that seem to be decreasing in number all the time. Labour have far more to say. Uh, one of the interesting omissions from the Labour manifesto, actually, is that they make no mention of an SPS agreement with the European Union, which is something they have talked about a lot. And I can't quite figure out whether that's just because they forgot or whether there is something more profound uh, at work here. But Labour certainly say they're going to reset the tone of relations with the European Union, and they lay out some concrete steps, a security pact with the EU, uh, mutual recognition of qualifications, a veterinary agreement that they would like to see happen were they to be elected. The other final thing I would say about this, sorry, I forgot to click the slide on, is that it is worth noting the position of reform and the Liberal Democrats, not because it's going to have a massive impact on the election and its outcome, but because I think they might be significant in the period after the election. If you think about reform, who've taken a very, very hardline position, unsurprisingly, talking about pulling out of the Windsor framework, uh, scrapping remaining EU regulations, I think 
if the election goes as the polls indicate it will, that those kind of arguments might have a role to play in any putative conservative leadership election. The pressure on the conservatives from the reform to be stronger on Brexit, I think, is going to be real. And I'll talk in a moment about what the Lib Dems might mean for Labour, because I think that, too, could be quite significant. So let me just assume that Labour win the election. I don't think that's making news by doing that at the moment. <coughs> Several things. One, we will see a change of tone, and we'll see a change of tone immediately. We'll see it at the NATO summit. We'll see it at the European Political Community Summit being held in Blenheim on the 18th of July. In fact, I expect that the 18th of July will be a bit like, for those of a certain vintage, watching Tony Blair at Amsterdam immediately after he was elected. We all remember the shots of him cycling with fellow EU leaders. I mean, I was most struck by the sight of Chancellor Cole on a bike, to be honest, but uh, we'll leave that to one side. I think that is pretty much the kind of thing we can expect to see at the EPC. A Labour leader coming in and saying, we are going to do things differently. We are going to be good friends. We're going to be good allies. And that is significant in and of its own right. Uh, and I think the European Union probably will want to sit down with the Brits and talk about security. I'm less convinced about some of the economic stuff. There is still a lingering fear in my mind that the Labour Party thinks that negotiating economic add-ons to the Trade and Cooperation Agreement will be easier than, in fact, it will be. I think there's an assumption that the European Union will be so delighted to see a Labour government that they will make concessions. And in Rachel Reeves' recent interview in the Financial Times, I was struck by what she was saying about chemicals regulations, because the language she was using about alignment struck me as redolent of some of the things we've heard before about, well, if we align, then, you know, things will get better. It doesn't work as easily as that. So I suspect that there are some very difficult negotiations to come with the European Union on a lot of these issues. But for me, what is more interesting, and there was a really good Katie Ball's piece in the eye about this the other day, is trying to wrap your head around what a Labour government means. Because all the things we've got used to over the last 15 years will be fundamentally different. And one of the things that will be fundamentally different, I think, is the fact that the pressure on a Labour Prime Minister will come from the opposite direction to the pressure has, uh, that has been on a Conservative Prime Minister. That is to say, as Katie says in her article, you know, we're thinking about a world in which no one really gives a damn what the ERG thinks because they're irrelevant. But we're thinking about a world in which people might start to worry about what Stella Creasy is saying uh, from Labour for Europe because the pressure inside the Labour Party will be for greater cooperation with the European Union and for a closer relationship with the European Union. And that is where I think the Lib Dems become interesting because if they decide to actually admit to their policy, because curiously, as of now, they have a policy that they're keeping secret to all intents and purposes, which is to rejoin the single market. If they start talking about that loudly, the possibility is real that this ramps up pressure on a Starmer government to go further and faster than they have to date said. So I think politically we're going to see a very different world in which Starmer, for all his moderation on the European Union, might face internal pressure and indeed external pressure to go further. And that might be reinforced by economic circumstances. Economic circumstances in two ways. Firstly, because as Joel writes about very, very clearly and interestingly in the report, the problems of divergence from the European Union are an absolute nightmare for the British state. Tracking divergence, reacting to divergence, figuring out what our strategy should be when it comes to divergence. And I should say, we all expected before the referendum that divergence would mean us changing EU law. What divergence actually means is the bloody Europeans doing things that we've got to figure out if we want to keep up with them or not. That is a real headache for Whitehall and will be a headache for Westminster and the government is going to have to wrestle with that. And the second economic pressure, I think, is from the performance of the economy. Labour have come up with this very bold, some might say rash, promise that the UK will have the highest levels of sustained growth in the G7. Labour's answer to everything is, well, we'll grow the economy. Uh, with precious little in the way of evidence as to how they will make that happen. Now, what we know is that locked up in the customs union and the single market is the potential for growth. 
What we know as well is there are some hideously difficult political compromises that will need to be made. Now, I'm not for a moment suggesting that a first-term Starmer will suddenly say, let's have freedom of movement and get in the single market. What I am saying, though, is a combination of political and economic pressures might drive Labour to be a little bit more ambitious in power than they have been willing to be in opposition. A couple of final things. Firstly, lest we forget there are two sides to any negotiation. Uh, and the European Union, whilst I think perfectly willing to sit down and talk to the Brits, A, has a number of other priorities. It is absolutely striking every time you visit an EU member state, with the possible exception of the Republic of Ireland, that they don't talk about us all the time. I mean, it's really quite hurtful, really. Uh, but we are not high on their list of priorities at the moment. Uh, and secondly, the European Union, and I say this as someone sort of embittered by 20 plus years of researching and teaching about the European Union, the defining feature of the European Union is it is utterly ruthless in its negotiations with third countries. It doesn't play nice. It doesn't sacrifice its interests. It tends to say, this is what we want. Get back to us when you're ready to accept it. Now, I think lots may change. The European Union itself may change under the pressures of trying to incorporate a Ukraine that obviously, in my opinion, won't be ready for membership in 2030. There might be a more flexible structure in place there. It's still an open question as to whether that flexibility is available for people moving away from the European Union even if it is for countries that are keen to be moving towards the European Union. So there are lots of unknowns, but we shouldn't forget that one of the unknowns is on the EU side. The final thing I would say is we do seem to have reached some kind of equilibrium in our relationship with the European Union after the signing of the Windsor framework. Uh, and we do seem to be in a situation where Brexit no longer dominates our politics in a way it did for all those years between 2016 and the signing of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. But that doesn't mean that Brexit's impact on our politics has gone away. This is a chart from the British election study, and what it shows basically is that the Brexit alignment is alive and well. Sure, Labour have got loads more voters now, the Conservatives have got far fewer voters now, but there is still a disproportionate division in terms of the fact that Leavers disproportionately support the Conservatives, Remainers disproportionately support the Labour Party. Now, this might not play out in our future politics in terms of a debate about the European Union, because as we know, Brexit in many ways is a cipher for a load of values issues such as immigration, notably. It's about worldviews rather than about left versus right. But lest we kid ourselves, that division that wasn't invented by the referendum of 2016 but was given form and substance by that referendum of 2016 has hung around far longer than I, for one, expected it to do so. And the current indication is it's going to be there for the foreseeable future. So never underestimate the possibility that this becomes a dividing line in our politics again once the immediate crisis of the cost of living crisis and the election to come are out of the way. Thank you very much. I think Katie's going to take questions. Thank you very much, Anne. And so, yes, it's uh, we've um, 15 minutes for, for no questions. And no more. I have extra incentive to make sure this panel finishes on time. Um, so we can take questions on Slido. Um, for those online, and if you're in the room, you can also use Slido, or there's also a microphone. Um, to begin with, though, I will ask a question myself. I want to begin by congratulating you on yet another report, um, which I trust is um, as excellent as all the others. I love taking credit for the work of others. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, and I just want to thank you for not taking the squillions um, and for your um, commitment to making social science accessible. And if it's not to put you on the spot uh, too much, to ask you... Um, in a situation where we do have eerie silence about Brexit and perhaps declining political salience, what is the role of social science and social scientists in making such research accessible? What do you think is the value of it, particularly in an election? Well, I'd say a couple of things. I mean, firstly, I'm one of those people that thinks it is part of the job description of being a social scientist to communicate your findings outside the academy. Uh, and secondly, I think on any issue of public policy, and this isn't reserved to UK and a changing Europe, you can think about somewhere like the Institute for Fiscal Studies, it is important that policy and public debates are based upon the best available evidence. Uh, it doesn't mean that 
people should stick narrowly to a sort of IFS approach to fiscal policy because there are political choices and political constituencies to bear in mind. But as a starting point, I think the role of academia is to provide the information that allows people to make informed choices. And I don't think that changes because of where we are in the Brexit saga. I just think that is a sort of a truth, as it were. Thanks, Alan. So uh, we have, so there's a question at the back there, Mirren, um, in the, the gentleman in the middle there mm -hmm. at the back. Thank you. Could you introduce yourself, if you don't mind? Yeah, yes, indeed. Um, Ewan Grant, um, United Kingdom Defence Forum. I've worked in Ukraine on European, as a contractor on European Commission projects. It's fair to say those were not the European Commission's finest hour, and I thought um, Dr. Menon's comments were really spot on in highlighting some key Thank issues you. there. Thank you. My question is, do you see any signs of fairly quick movement from Brussels, but particularly from, Brussels, uh, from Paris and Berlin, in their own right and feeding into Brussels on a security pact. Um, because you said it's a two-way process. And there are going to be developments, revelations in the British courtroom in a few months' time, which really are going to show up some very awkward questions, both about Brussels, but also about Germany particularly. So thank you. Thank you. Do you want to answer that? I mean, I think there is a desire on the part of Paris and Berlin and indeed most member states not only to improve UK-EU security relations but to improve security relations between the UK and individual member states. But as ever, the devil is going to be in the detail. A security pact that simply increases the level of cooperation and coordination maybe introduces regular ministerial meetings. I see that as being quite easy to achieve, a security pact that allows the UK access to communitarianized defense initiatives like the European Defense Fund, which is something that the defense ministry here is desperate for, I think that's gonna take a significant amount of time and is gonna require far more flexibility from the European Union than it has shown to date. Thank you. I'm going to take a question off Slido, and it's the one who isn't anonymous. It's John Pete. Um, he says, eight years after the two-thirds vote to stay in the EEC in 1975, Labour wanted out. Um, yet eight years after the 52-48% leave vote, nobody wants to go back in. Well, not officially, anyway. So why is that, he's saying? Well, firstly, John, I can't believe you're not actually in the room, which is disappointing. Uh, I think partly because of fatigue. I mean, those, those four years, whilst undeniably excellent for UK in a changing Europe, were, 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 were quite tiring for the rest of the population. Uh, and I think that plays a big part. I think also that, that I mean, one of the things that's going to come in in terms of our relationship with the European Union is our politics suffers from near chronic short-termism. And the idea of undertaking a negotiation, the fruits of which can be plucked five, eight, ten years later, is not something we've become very good at. And I think, you know, any major reassessment of our relationship with the European Union is going to take a significant amount of time. Uh, and that's just not how our politics is working at the moment. So I think a combination of those two reasons. Uh, but as I said, the Lib Dems are talking about rejoining. They're talking about single market membership as a step on the path to ultimately rejoining. And I think it'll be very, very interesting if they do well in this election, they then start to become noisier in their support for that policy position. I think that might change things. I'm not for a moment suggesting we're about to embark on a debate about rejoin. All I'm saying is it is very hard to predict where the debate goes after the election. Mm, very interesting, thank you. Yes, you have a question at the front here. Just wait for the mic. And please could you introduce yourself? Thanks very much. Not so much a question, but a comment, if I may, or an observation. Um, I originally worked with a, an international firm. I'm Canadian, but I had a Czech mother and an English father, so I sort of had a foot in three camps. The economics, the, the, the slow growth, it's not all just 
the economic side of it. It's the attraction of the country. And what I have observed, if I may say so, is that England was an exciting place to come and work because you were meeting people from everywhere. It was open. You could go skiing in Switzerland. You could go to the Med. You could work here. And the flavor of the country has changed over the last few years. And that is less attractive to the kind of people that you want in to develop new businesses in the UK. And you never talk about it anywhere. You never see it in the papers. It's all just about the economics. But that is woven into the desire to set up business somewhere and grow. And I think that's something that the UK is missing in a big, big way. And I hope it gets corrected because England deserves better. Thank you. Can I, even though that was a comment, can I just... Yeah. I mean, there's several things about that. I mean, one, we should be careful. When, when you say the country, I think you mean London because there's large chunks of the United Kingdom that aren't massively cosmopolitan. But secondly, I'm not sure I agree with you. Be, you know, post-Brexit, one of the most striking things is net migration has hit 700,000. You know, we're more open to immigrants now than we were when we were a member state of the European Union. Now, those immigrants, and I happen to think this is a good thing, are largely Indian. Uh, with, with some Nigerians thrown in. But I don't, you know, I don't think we've become more closed. I think there's a debate about whether we should become more closed. Uh, but I, I just don't think that's the case. We've just become less... Does it? I mean, we could talk about this afterwards. I'm not, I'm not wholly convinced, to be honest. It's interesting. We have a question here in the corner. Thank you. Um, Sophie Ng from Politico. Um, you talked about the impact of Brexit on goods trade. Um, I just wondered, if, is it too soon to see an impact from the rollout of border checks this year? Well, I suppose the glib answer is yes, because we haven't rolled them out. So we, we haven't got the, the data as yet. I mean, we expect that to have an impact. Uh, I would expect actually that impact to start showing through in the data before the border checks are imposed, because people anticipate uh, what's going to happen. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence. Uh, I mean, Peter Foster churns it out week on week in his uh, briefing that smaller businesses based in the continent are reassessing their trade with the United Kingdom in view of those border checks. So yes, I do expect it to have a different, uh, make, a, make a difference. I think for the sectors involved, it's relatively small in GDP terms, but massively disruptive for those sectors. But I mean, one of the, one of the neat paradoxes about Brexit is l the Labour government is going to have to put those checks in place in order to sit down with Brussels to negotiate their removal. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's only if we have those checks in place that Brussels has any incentive to sit down and talk with us in the first place. She just on that, we have a couple of questions on Slido, one from Vijay Strau, um, and it's related to that point about um, how, how can we assess the impact of Brexit because it hasn't really properly happened yet. Well, I mean, it depends what you mean by it hasn't properly happened yet. I mean, it is absolutely the case. So, A, it has happened in the sense of trade barriers between the UK and the EU. Not all the trade barriers, as Sophie's question just implied, but most of the barriers are now in place. What I suspect Vijay means is that we haven't done it properly at home yet. And here's, I mean, here's yet another Brexit paradox, which is the people who, who kept the flame of Euroscepticism burning, who were largely in the Conservative Party, did so on the back of a message that the European Union impeded growth in the United Kingdom by making us over-regulate. So you all remember the fights over the working time directive and the like. There was a, a bunch of Conservatives associated with the Fresh Start group who said, we need to leave the European Union because then we can properly free up our economy, we can deregulate and we will become really competitive. The paradox lies in the fact that the only way they were able to implement that vision was by cre creating a coalition with a bunch of voters who are fundamentally opposed to that vision. That is to say, the people who got Brexit over the line were a bunch of people who don't want deregulation, who like workers' rights, who actually quite like generous welfare payments. And so that coalition, which is the current Conservative Party, came into being and found it impossible to do the sort of things that the original Brexiters wanted. So we've ended up where we've ended up because the only way to muster a majority for Brexit was by creating a coalition that wouldn't allow you to do what you thought Brexit was for in the first place. <laughs> 
if that makes sense. Just about. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I should mention too, there was an FSB report issued yesterday about um, uh, the border target operation model and its impact already. We have a question at the back there. Thank you. Um, Pamela Mayorkas, former translator at the Commission of the European Communities. <coughs> you said something along the lines of the EU, <coughs> sorry, is a formidable negotiator. Therefore, the UK is up against this formidable negotiator. But I wondered whether you meant the Commission of the EU or the Council of Ministers, because they're two very, very different animals. Well, when it comes to trade, first and foremost, I meant the Commission. Uh, I mean, obviously, the Council is going to set political frameworks for negotiations. But once those frameworks are set, I have no evidence at all from everything I know about EU trade negotiations over the years, even with those trade negotiations with developing countries, that inclines me to think the EU is willing to do favours when it doesn't consider them in its own interests. And I think here sometimes we're in danger of assuming that because we're who we are and because we're uniquely important, which of course we are, uh, that we can cut corners. And I just don't think that's how it works when you have trade talks with the European Union. Uh, we have a question up there in the, in the middle. Would you mind putting up your hand again, please? Yes, thank you. Right. Just straight <coughs> up there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. I mean, you've talked about... Um, UK-EU relations almost as something that's self-contained, but there are three other big factors there. One's the United States of America, what it thinks about Europe, what Europe thinks about the US. There's China and, of course, Russia, um, who are waging an aggressive war in Eastern Europe. So to what extent are broader circumstances going to shape the relationship between the UK and the EU? And crucially, should UK and EU be able to do more to cooperate in the wider area of foreign policy and defence. I know that then feeds into NATO, but then, of course, an awful lot of countries are members of both the EU and NATO, so you can't disaggregate the two. Are circumstances going to force the UK and EU closer together, whether they like it or not? Well, I mean, your point on NATO is well taken. I think that's part of the answer, and I think it is absolutely the case that what Russia is doing in Ukraine and the sense of a renewed th threat from China is going to make us collaborate more closely than if those two factors didn't exist. It also, of course, works against us in some ways because the EU's reaction to things like IRA in the United States, a sort of protectionist attempt to uh, prop up domestic industries, has been to do the same thing. And that actually leaves us in quite a lonely place. I mean, one of the assumptions of the sort of buccaneer free trading vision of Brexit was that the world would remain open and our largest trading partners would remain open because that would make it easier to forge that sort of freewheeling, free trading future. At the moment, however, one of the, one of the implications of geopolitics has been greater closing on the part of those economies, which actually makes our life more difficult rather than easier. Thank you. We're just about on time. We've got one minute. Which, no, I know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to save the, the hardest question to last, which is asking you to look even further ahead to the future. Oh, God. <laughs> if, would there be a possibility in eight years' time of another report on UKE relations? Um, <laughs> if yeah. not, why not? Or if so, why? Well, I very much hope we're in a position to write a report in eight years' time. Uh, lobby your MP now. Uh, <laughs> Yes, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is we live on the doorstep of a continental-sized economy, and that's just geography. And in the same way that Canadians spend a lot of their waking hours thinking about the United States and worrying about what it's doing, in the same way that China's neighbours do exactly the same thing about China, the EU's neighbours are forced, whether they like it or not, to spend a lot of their time thinking about the European Union because what it does shapes what we are able to do. So whether we're in or out, I mean, another Brexit paradox, I suppose, is the fact that Brexit condemns us to spend more time thinking about the European Union than we had to do when we were a member state. Because in a sense, when we were a member state, it just happened. Now we have to make choices. So I think, you know, whether we like it or not, we are going to be thinking and talking about the European Union and our relationship with it 
for the foreseeable future. Excellent answer. Thank you very much, Anna. Thanks for all the questions, and we'll finish this session now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.